Well, we're all here. Good <coughs> afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. I think we have an interesting discussion ahead of us. This uh, session is being recorded for television, so we'll, for about two or three times, I'll announce a break, which for us will be very brief, 30 seconds. But it's for eventual insertion of commercials in there. It's for Global News of, of Brazil that we'll have a program with this discussion. Uh, as I said, we have a promising discussion with these gentlemen here who are going to help us understand what's going on with the BRICS. We had a similar meeting, similar discussion last year, when the big question was, are the BRICS going through a midlife crisis? And the conclusion was that uh, they were going through a midlife crisis. And the forecast was that things were going to improve soon. Well, that forecast was just as bad as my own forecast that Brazil was going to win the World Cup. <laughs> so uh, I won't say much about that. Uh, now we think that the midlife crisis is over. But the question that many people ask is, is it paralysis? Are we reaching a time for retirement of the BRICS? Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the creator of the BRICS, uh, Jim O'Neill, uh, the economist, the British economist, said that uh, when he created the, the acronym, he made certain assumptions about the countries and how they would perform. And he writes now, China is the, the only one to have either met or possibly slightly surpassed my expectations. He wrote that he was disappointed with the Brazil, Russia, and India, although hopeful with the recent signs from India. Uh, indeed, indeed, India is a hopeful exception, having grown 5.5% last year, expected to pass 7% this year. It has a new government under Narendra Modi, seen as a reformist, uh, more market-oriented, uh, a difference with his predecessor that seemed to be more concentrated on state role in the, in the economy. And Minister of Finance here, Avram Jaitley, is here with us part of the new team. Brazil also has a new government, which is the same old government under President Dilma Rousseff, but with a new team in the economic area. It's, the team is led by an orthodox economist from the Chicago School, working for a government of the left. Uh, an odd combination it has to tackle economic stagnation with growth expected to reach only around half a percent this year. Marcelo Neri here with us is the new Minister of Strategic Affairs in Brazil. South Africa also has a new government, a new old government, with Jacob Zuma re-elected a few months ago and his party, the African National Congress, retaining power in parliament. The economy is at the slow speed of 1.5% growth registered last year. Minister of Finance Musa Nene is here to help us understand what's happening with South Africa. China is growing. China is always growing. It grew 7.4% last year. Not bad for any other country. They will be having a party. But for China, it's kind of strange to be growing at a little bit more than half of what it used to in recent years. Is that the new normal that the Chinese president talks about? We will hear from Professor Justin Lin from Beijing University. Russia, well, Russia. We have to check the price of oil today, but at around half of what it was a year ago, it does not provide encouraging news to an economy so heavily dependent on oil and gas. Economic sanctions adopted by the West in response to Russia's action in the Ukraine have only added to the difficulties. The country is in recession, expected to grow at a have a negative growth of GDP this year of 3%, according to IMF figures a few days ago. Alexei Kutrin is here. He's a former minister, finance minister from 2007 to 2011. He's now at St. Petersburg State University. So this is a brief summary uh, about difficulties with the BRICS for sure. The question is, are these difficulties just a phase uh, in order to move away from this and get into uh, growth? 
investments will be required to pump the economies of all the countries. Where will these investments come from? And where will they go? Uh, the panel may give us some directions. And as I mentioned, the role of the investors, perhaps we should hear first from someone who could be seen as a major international investor. Carlos Goss is a leader of an important automotive industry, constantly looking at all these economies and having to decide where it's worth putting its money. Not hot money like in the financial markets that can get out quick. When you establish an industry, you've got to think long term. Carlos Gosney is a Brazilian by birth, but very international in his job as chairman and CEO of the Renault Nissan Alliance. And perhaps we can start with you. Uh, are you discouraged by the poor economic performance of the BRIC countries? Uh, do you see encouraging signs of near and long term perspectives? Well, um, I am not discouraged, I'm disappointed with some of them, uh, I must admit. Obviously, uh, we are big investors in all these countries. Uh, we think the potential of these countries is very strong, and we still believe, even though there are some short-term adjustments that are taking place, particularly, you know, mentioning Brazil and Russia uh, presently. It was India last year, or in the last uh, couple of years. But the potential is here. We believe in the potential. As, as you said, the car industry invests not in function of the next two years, but in the next 10 to 15 years, because these are major investments that usually when you make the decision, you start to see the results three or four years after you've made the decision, and it's going to be lasting. So uh, China, as you said, we're a big investor in China. China has always delivered on the short term and will continue to deliver. So we feel very good about what's going on in China. Uh, India, we believe a lot into the potential of India. Again, some disappointment uh, in the recent past, but again, absolutely no giving up on the potential of India and the perspective of 2015 is very positive. Uh, Brazil has a, a huge potential. And I would say uh, the, the disappointment comes from the fact that there is such a discrepancy between the present performance of the economy in Brazil and the potential we see, uh, we see in Brazil. And uh, uh, Russia, we are in the same situation. And uh, frankly, that means the big question about Russia is how to get out of this hole. That means we know that we are today in a situation which is very difficult. And uh, what we would like is to try to understand what is the exit strategy from the present, uh, the present situation. This is where we are. But we continue to invest in all the countries, which means there is absolutely no uh, uh, re retreat from any one of them because we consider that uh, there is no future. Well, you mentioned Russia that being in a, in a hole. And that I would ask uh, Mr. Kudrin next to you, uh, when you consider that Russia is in recession, the ruble has lost 40% of its value, uh, inflation is up, uh, capital flight is intense. Uh, it is indeed a hole, as Carla Gordon just said. How do you get out of that hole? <clears throat> Thank you very much for your question. I'm going to speak in Russian. I would like to start off uh, uh, not only with the economics. Uh, I uh, recall, I remember how the BRICS uh, uh, was uh, formed and shaped. Uh, um, it's not only the uh, idea of uh, an outstanding ec economist O'Neill and leaders of the country, they also were favorable of this idea. And uh, uh, in 2006, uh, they had a summit in uh, St. Peter uh, Petersburg. I uh, uh, participated in that summit. Uh, I accompanied my president. And I think, I think that um, BRICS, uh, as a, a union of uh, close uh, countries who are close, uh, which are close to each other in spirit, uh, it goes beyond uh, the statistics of uh, the successes uh, that we had in the previous year years. Um, the idea actually was uh, that uh, these countries have long-term potential, uh, um, not related to specific uh, economic cycle when you have uh, ups and downs. Uh, 
huge potential of these countries in terms of uh, using the uh, possibilities, uh, human capital resources uh, to increase uh, their economic development uh, and to increase their GDP per capita. Uh, but uh, they are very close in terms of their interest in the world economy. It is a group of countries uh, that uh, want to protect the interests of the developing uh, markets, uh, emerging markets, uh, so that their voices uh, uh, could be heard in uh, uh, major decisions in trade and uh, development and other political issues. Uh, as a Minister of Finance, uh, uh, finances, uh, um, I finance um, 11 years um, uh, and 11 years uh, uh, part of the managing board of the uh, IMF. Uh, all the ministers of finances of BRICS uh, get together before the annual meeting of the IMF or before the uh, G20. They get together and define uh, their common position uh, during these summits. Uh, as um, uh, leaders of the country, they get together before uh, the next uh, G20 meeting. They coordinate their positions. Their positions are close. Um, the second point that I would like to raise, uh, uh, BRICS countries, um, uh, it's uh, about 27% uh, in the global uh, GDP, close to European one. But uh, in terms uh, of uh, IMF, uh, Europe has 32% uh, of the votes, and uh, BRICS countries 11%. Uh, so emerging markets are underappreciated under, uh, in the key financial institution of the world, where they take decisions to support uh, uh, BRICS countries and other developing countries. And this situation um, not is not in tune anymore with the status of these countries, their role and uh, in the world. Uh, that's why a decision was taken to redistribute uh, these quotas uh, in favor of the emerging markets. And, and uh, the redistribution actually was affected, uh, a symbolic one, uh, uh, China, uh, from five to six uh, 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 point thirty nine uh, uh, percent uh, their uh, share a uh, simple one but very important that means that uh, more attention will be paid to the voice of these countries and but the United States didn't approve this decision the Congress did, didn't approve uh, this decision decision so uh, we have a new choice I mean BRICS countries uh, uh, to uh, trust uh, our destiny uh, to the IMF, uh, where they have uh, not enough shares uh, or votes, uh, or to create uh, parallel institutions for development. And the recent decisions of the BRICS countries to set up uh, the uh, development uh, bank uh, with a capital of $100 billion uh, and uh, $100 billion in terms of the reserve of the currencies of these countries, this is uh, an answer, uh, an answer that uh, institutions are being created uh, which uh, will have more trust on the part of these uh, countries. Uh, that's why BRICS today, it's not only statistics of economic growth, it's also, a, it's also politics. And there, uh, it is true that it, it, together those factors are important, but BRIC countries exist individually as well. And individually, a lot of the countries are having serious trouble. In the specific case of Russia, it's a very difficult moment for the Russian economy. Well, I limit myself to the economy. It's a difficult moment for Russia overall. But as Carla Goss mentioned, the hole that, the, that Russia is in, you know, that's specifically how does Russia get out of that role, that the hole that uh, of its own making in many ways. Спасибо. <coughs> Thank you. Three years ago, I left the government. Uh, uh, nevertheless, I can uh, uh, voice my view. Uh, Russia, it's 11 uh, percent uh, uh, our uh, uh, de indebtedness compared to the GDP, uh, one of the lowest rates in the world. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a huge fa foundation, strong foundation, not to have uh, defaults and problems with the indebtedness. Uh, of $400 billion in gold reserves in Russia, uh, $190 billions. Uh, this is the reserve of the government. Uh, the government has uh, good reserves to 
today to secure the transitional period, uh, to a uh, period uh, transition to another level of prices. Uh, I always considered that $100 uh, per barrel, it's an artificial price. Uh, uh, lower than $80, uh, maybe $60, uh, that's the realistic uh, prices. And Russia should learn how to live in moderate prices, in the world of moderate prices. And the reserve would allow to transfer to this uh, moderate level of uh, 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 prices. Um, and it's good uh, that we can see the real prices and take them as a reference, uh, not the prices which were um, due to some reasons uh, temporary in their nature and uh, uh, um, didn't show the real perspectives for Russia. But in Russia, we have other problems, uh, structural problems. Uh, and all our countries uh, uh, grow slowly and, uh, uh, because we are now at uh, the stage of a new period of structural reforms. The old models uh, uh, has already worked. Uh, and as uh, developing economies, uh, we should uh, uh, always be aware of what is going on and uh, uh, push for reforms. Uh, Russia, unfortunately, didn't do it. And now sh it has to do it uh, under less uh, 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 good conditions, uh, maybe 3 4%. Uh, uh, percent. This year, uh, the drop. Um, uh, um, last year, we had the growth of uh, 1.5%. Uh, this is a, a serious signal that we uh, should launch uh, uh, the reforms. Uh, uh, one or two years uh, will be required uh, to move uh, into the uh, area of uh, uh, gradual growth. Um, and the devil, uh, the, uh, uh, the um, the evolution of the ruble, uh, two reasons, uh, sanctions and uh, the drop in oil prices. Uh, basically, the impact is the same. So double blow for Russia. Uh, the currency blow, that's why uh, uh, this uh, plummeting exchange rates. And uh, also the sanctions, uh, as I mentioned before. And this is a geopolitical reasons, uh, reason. It is uh, somehow related to the fact that uh, Russia wanted uh, somehow uh, uh, to position itself uh, differently among its neighbors. Um, it is not satisfied uh, uh, how the world defines uh, the destiny of Russia and neighboring countries. So this is uh, a certain uh, way of payment uh, for uh, what Russia is doing. Um, I, I don't want to, want to uh, dwell into uh, details, places and minuses. Uh, there are pluses and, and minuses, but uh, the, present, uh, the president of Russia believed that uh, uh, they, we have to go through this difficulty so that to confirm our new role in the world. Thank you. You mentioned uh, the need to uh, reform, that Russia didn't do it soon enough. And that takes me to uh, Marcelo Neri, the current minister of Brazil. Well, the new government of Brazil, which is the old government of Brazil with the new, new uh, economic command, is trying to do economic reforms. But then you have a finance minister whose economic thinking and ideology contradicts completely what the government has been following. Should we be preparing ourselves for a divorce soon? Well, I, I believe, you know, we are actually doing what we did in 2003 in the sense, I think Brazil is following what you may call a middle path. You have a redistribution aspect. Brazil is the only BRIC countries that where inequality fell and fell sharply since 2001. And, uh, but also has a pro-market strategy. So it's not only social, it's a combination of both. And I think with this new economic team, we are, we are uh, following the same strategy we followed before. I think maybe we diverge a little bit from the, or a lot from the middle path. And I think we are going back to it. And we have in our advantage the fact that we can give a, uh, a confidence shock in the in the economy. That's uh, our attempt, and I think that uh, Minister Levy symbolizes this confidence shock. And in a way, the polarization that exists in Brazilian society—it uh, was very clear, for instance, in the last election. 
is a bit artificial in a sense that uh, you know objective uh, indicators of polarization in Brazil, polarization of income, of education has never been so small. But polarization of ideas, maybe, and I think the government of Brazil today incorporates, you know, a wide range. You know, uh, uh, a, Chicago, a person from Chicago, the, one of the best economists you can get, and also the social concerns. So I see, uh, if uh, I think it's a very good, a ve a ve I think a very brave, and a good attempt to reestablish the middle path. If my Chinese colleague, uh, excuse me for using this. Uh, metaphor, and um, but I, I think you no know, Brazil. You, you may say, well, Brazil is not doing so well. I agree with you. GDP is growing very, very slow. 0 0.8 GDP per capita in the last 2012, 13, 14 will be worse. But people's income per capita, real income, despite of all this slowdown has been growing at 5.5% a year on per capita income. We're going to have to do adjustments. Our unemployment rate is quite low now, so it's a good time in a sense to do adjustments. And I think we need them, reforms, starting with a fiscal adjustment and a confidence shock. Uh, all right, a confidence shock in Brazil and uh, with slow growth. Well, South Africa is growing a little bit better than Brazil but still very low uh, international standards. It's the richest economy on the continent, although Nigeria is trying to catch up quick. And the IMF has just warned South Africa that it, uh, the country needs to tackle structural problems seriously. And your own Chamber of Commerce declared a few days ago that an apathetic approach to the economic challenge has led to constrained environment that South Africa finds itself in. Quite a challenge, Mr. Nenin, isn't it? How do you sort that out? Indeed, <clears throat> quite a challenge. And um, uh, I would uh, first want to say that uh, it is perhaps precisely because of that reason that we find ourselves in, um, in this um, collective <clears throat> of uh, the BRICS countries, countries that um, to some extent, confront uh, similar challenges. But also, as a voice of the emerging markets, I think it is an important uh, forum for us to be able to tackle some of these challenges collectively and collaboratively. As a country, um, for the first time, South Africa has put before its uh, citizens a comprehensive plan, our Vision 2030 which has got all the elements of a country that is committed to addressing the structural challenges and uh, uh, putting in place the reforms that uh, the chamber is calling for. And um, we are working very closely with um, uh, the private sector to address these challenges. And uh, we now have embarked on a process where there are working groups between government and the private sector. There are three key elements of the uh, 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 national development plan that are premised on two key ones of um, uh, reducing the cost of doing business whilst reducing uh, the cost of living for our citizens. And those three elements are those that we would want to create an environment where we have a private sector that is able to we create an environment for the private sector to thrive, but also we want to create a, a, a professional public service that would deliver the services to our people in order to redress uh, uh, our job, to address our challenges. But also we want an active citizenry that is also going to hold the, um, um, the administration <coughs> accountable. We've made some strides, as you say, I correctly point out. This uh, government, uh, it's a, the new term. Uh, it's a new administration, but it's a new term of our president. And he's been driving a, a serious um, a, a developmental agenda, which is anchored on our a massive infrastructure rollout. Uh, Does it involve a, a cut in government expenses? Fiscal consolidation, as I said, when we tabled our medium-term budget policy statement, uh, is actually inevitable. 
This is the time for fiscal consolidation. We have been able to um, um, uh, apply a counter-cyclical fiscal policy for the past few years whilst we were trying to expand our social, uh, social expenditure, but we have reached a point where we actually need to consolidate our um, 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 finances and that is what we're doing uh, for a period of two years and beyond the two years we will have built adequate uh, uh, fiscal space in order for us to uh, proceed with our agenda. But this does not necessarily mean a cut in expenditure but a cut in growth of our expenditure and uh, that we've put a, a plan before the nation and we actually have got practical uh, areas where we have identified as areas uh, where we would not compromise and continue roll out our infrastructure, continue to protect the poor and ensure that uh, the economy uh, continues to benefit from uh, uh, our interventions. In the case of India, uh, Minister uh, Jaitley, uh, your new Prime Minister, uh, Narendra Modi, presents himself as a reformist, uh, a market-oriented leader, but he faced a tradition in India uh, since independence of heavy reliance on the state uh, and strong resistance for a bureaucracy to, to change that. What chance do you think he has of, uh, to overcome that tradition? of state. Well, I think the most important change that has taken place in India is not merely a political change of government. There's a change of mindset. And there's a huge amount of popular support, particularly in the backdrop of slowdown in the last two years, that we must grow. And there is a fair amount of clarity about the roadmap which is required for that growth. And therefore, I don't think there is any resistance as far as the bureaucracy in India is concerned uh, to the reform process. Uh, but the bureaucracy has long been made a whipping boy for it. Uh, I think our challenge is we know the roadmap, we know the steps which have to be taken. The government has embarked on those steps uh, uh, quite expeditiously. Uh, but there's a lot of distance we have to cover. And. Uh, I think there is absolute clarity that India needs uh, to generate its domestic investment, it needs global investment, it needs uh, uh, radically to improve its own infrastructure, uh, it needs to uh, move up its manufacturing. So even if uh, this year, we, uh, 2015, we end with about 5.5% growth rate, uh, uh, which is okay by global standards, but India is still not smiling at those growth rates. Uh, uh, we, by our standards, we think it's uh, much below our real capacities. Uh, uh, and our target is to go back to the 8%, 9% growth rates, which are more natural to India. And I think we have the potential to do that. The manner in which the government is going, there is uh, the next year promises to be much better. We'll get into the 6.5% or so uh, growth rate leaks. And I think that's where the takeoff will start. Currently, not only have we changed the mood and the attitude with all these decisions, India, which had fallen off the global radar for the last uh, two years, I think the world has started showing anxiety and curiosity about India once again. The people are looking at us, and it's really for us in the government and the uh, policymakers in India to consolidate on that game. Uh, you, Minister Jaitley has mentioned uh, Eight nine percent is kind of a natural rate of growth for for India. It makes me think of China. Uh, we associated the natural growth of China with at least twelve percent. Now it's at seven point four percent. You know everybody would be celebrating that, but not China. Is this what the Chinese president calls the new normal? Does it it, it will be the rate that we should expect in the coming years? Did it have to be that way? Did it have to slow down? Well, first, I'd like to <clears throat> correct one statement you met. Please you do. expect China to grow at 12%, 13%. Yes, China achieved that a few years in the past 36 years. But whenever China reached 12%, 13%, China encountered high inflation. Certainly, those kind of growth rate <clears throat> was not sustainable. And in the past 36 years, the average growth rate in China indeed was 9.7%. Continuously for 36 years, 
That was a miracle in human history already. But certainly, we cannot expect those kind of two-digit growth rate continuously in the coming years for several reasons. China now is already the second largest economy measured by market exchange rate. But if we measure the economic size by purchasing power parity, China overtook the US last year to be the largest economy in the whole world. With its size, you cannot expect those kind of 9.8%, 9.7% can continue. But I do believe China still has the potential to grow at 8%, 8% per year in the coming decades. But that is a potential growth rate. Depends on the domestic and the international economic situations. Because we know for every country to grow, there are three drivers, export, investment, and consumption. But for export, I expect the you know, prospect is still going to be quite subdued. Because high income country have not fully recovered from the 2008 crisis. Eurozone, Japan are still in a mode of close to recession. US seem to recover, but the foundation is not very strong because the labor participation rate in US is still very low. And the US has not enjoyed the 6 or 7% rebound of the crisis yet. So under that kind of situation, I think Expo in the coming years cannot be a driver for the growth. And China needs to rely more on the domestic sources of growth. That is investment and consumption. And for that, I think that China should be able to <clears throat> use its strong position for investment and opportunity for investment. Just like yesterday, the Prime Minister Li Keqiang mentioned, as a middle-income country, China still has good opportunity for investment in industrial upgrading technological innovation. China also has a scope for further improvement in infrastructure and also for the environmental protection urbanization. All those areas are good investment opportunities. And I'd like to mention this distinguished China from the developed country. For the developed country, whenever they have a recession slow down in their economy, it's very hard for them to find good investment opportunities. But China is a middle income country. China still have huge opportunity for good investment. Not only the opportunity for investment, China is also in a very good position for making investment. Because the government debt, including the local government and the central government, it's only about 40% of the GDP. Not as good as our Russian friend, but among the best in the world. <clears throat> so the Chinese government can use fiscal expansion, counter cyclical intervention to support investment. And also the private saving in China is a high, it's as high as 50% of GDP. So the government can use its money to leverage the private sector investment. And also China has four trillion US dollars of reserve, the highest in the whole world. And I'd like to say, this distinguished China from many other developing countries. Because other developing countries should also have good investment opportunity for investment. But they may be constrained by the government's fiscal position, or the private saving, or the lack of foreign reserve. China are not constrained in that way. So in a sense that China should be able to maintain regional, reasonable level of investment. And with investment, we can maintain the employment. With an employment, you know, then we can maintain the consumption growth in China. So with this, I think I'm quite confident China will be able to maintain 7% growth rate in the coming five years or even decades. Certainly, this is lower than 
the 9.7% growth rate in the past 36 years, but as I say, due to the size and so on, and the global economy, this it will consider be, to be one of the highest growth in the whole world. And with the size, if China even grow it at 7%, China will contribute about one percentage point to the global growth rate. And that will be at least 25% of the global growth, can be even 30% of global growth. So China will continue to be the engine of the growth in the world. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have a small break now, and uh, we'll come back and we'll talk about kind of a ghost in the machine, oil. Like I said, this break is not a real break. They will eventually put commercials in here. We can organize ourselves, get a glass of water. Uh, well, I don't have a glass, but yes, I do. And we'll keep going. Okay, we, go, we start again. Like I said, uh, the ghost of the machine, oil, we're all concerned about the drop in the price of oil. Certain isn't the proper word. Some of us are very happy about it, but some others are worried. I would ask Carlos Gordon, as, as a, a leader of the auto industry, I'm sure your industry is happy about the fall in the oil prices, a trend that results in cheaper fuel, and therefore people will drive more. But since we're talking here about near and long-term prospects for investments, shouldn't the auto industry be, be moving towards uh, cleaner fuel faster than it is doing now to avoid this dependence on oil that, that could start again because it's so cheap now? Yeah, well, obviously, you give me a great argument to tell you, as you know, as we are leader in electric cars in the world, Obviously, my answer is going to be yes. Obviously, we have to move much faster. We have to be less dependent on oil, even though we're very realistic about the fact for the next 10 to 20 years, the auto industry will continue to heavily depend on oil. But the alternative fuels are extremely important. You mentioned oil price. It's interesting that last year there were a lot of debates on energy. Nobody has foreseen what's happening today. Nobody. I don't think I've seen any scenario in which the price of oil are where they are today. So in general, the price of oil is unpredictable. So we don't know where the price of oil is going to be next year or two years down the road. We can make assumption, but we don't know how much of truth there are behind the assumption. So we are in a position where we have to prepare ourselves for all the hypotheses, a very expensive oil or a very cheap oil, which means we need to be in different technologies that would allow us to face the different situation. Near the price of oil, there is one thing which is certain, is regulations on emissions are getting tougher everywhere. They are getting tougher in China, they are getting tougher in the United States, they are getting tougher in Europe. And in order to meet the emissions regulations, we have to develop the, what we call the clean technologies, allowing the cars to be at zero emission or at the very low emission. So yes, we have to move faster. We are moving into this direction, I would say, independently of the price of oil. But because the price of oil is so low now, do you think that will hold back those who are not following your example, let's say? Yeah, I, I would take it as more a headwind in front of the development of the clean technologies, but certainly not, uh, is not going to divert us from these investments because, again, first, price of oil is unpredictable, and second, emission regulation are going to force us to be much more efficient in terms of emissions. In, in the case of Russia, uh, we don't need to emphasize the fact that the low price of oil is a, pretty much a disaster. How much of a disaster for Russia? Oil and gas, obviously, considering that Russia has not diversified its economy as much as we all know it should have done many years ago. Thank you. 
First of all, I would like to uh, avoid the word disaster. There's no disaster as such. Um, as a matter of fact, let me uh, say it again. 0.5% growth uh, against a 3% decline uh, caused by both the sanctions and the uh, declining oil price are those two factors that I mentioned earlier. But we understand that this does not take a long time. But within the next three to five years, this is going to pass. And Russia will be able to uh, um, uh, implement some reforms. I would agree with Carlos that uh, oil prices are unpredictable. And we cannot say what the price is going to be in four to five years. So I would rather. Mm, uh, well, let, me, let me qualify the situation in the following uh, vocabulary, that we are going through a patch of low prices uh, as a result of a number of factors that have affected the current situation in the market, particularly uh, some uh, oil producing uh, countries like Iran, Iraq, for example, Libya, they uh, have some free uh, unutilized capacities and uh, for some time they have been producing less than traditional than earlier. Also, there's this shale. Um, well, not revolution is the word, but the, the U.S. has been producing a lot of shale gas and shale oil, and a number of other factors uh, that also have contributed to this uh, decline, and also demand is going down. Also, there are some cycles, and as we know, there are electrically driven cars and hydrogen cars. I fully, I'm fully supportive of Toyota's initiative that uh, opened the line of uh, the hydrogen um, uh, uh, cars. So they are trying to now create a market share in this gas uh, is going to be used, gas as natural gas is going to be used more often now as a uh, source. Uh, well, so we have uh, terminals and tankers for LNG to produce and transport LNG. So um, as a matter of fact, recently a whole new market has uh, taken shape in terms of LNG. Uh, I, I have not mentioned all of the uh, events that have contributed to this market dynamics, and we don't uh, do our math correctly. So we cannot predict uh, these volatilities, what is going to happen with the oil price within the next three years. It's, it, may, it may go down to $40. It may go up to 60 or $80 per barrel. Well, some say that investments are going um, to shrink in this sector, and that uh, will uh, trigger uh, an increase in prices and demand will grow and also prices uh, will go up. So we, we, let's refrain from making a progress in this. So Russia has to try and adapt itself to um, this moderate level of uh, oil prices. So my estimate is between 60 to 80. Perhaps I'm overestimating the price, but still I think this is the um, uh, the, the, the order of magnitude. And, and of course, this will uh, make Russia diversify its economy and try to make less focus on oil and then try and diversify its economy and pay more attention to other sectors. Thank you. In the case of Brazil, the, the oil, you know, there have been different analysis about the impact of the drop in oil prices in Brazil. Uh, first of all, and as a minister for strategic affairs, you must be thinking long run what it means for Brazil. And I, if I should add, in, specifically in the context of what's happening with Petrobras, uh, this gigantic scandal that might hurt the company quite a bit. If you put all that plus the drop in the price of oil, what is the, the final result of this mixture? First, the price of oil it'll fall is a good is good news in the short run. For Brazil, we are net importers. You know, if you take into account der derivatives, but given our investment prospects, especially pre-salt, you know, deep oil, deep oil that we are exploring, uh, you know, at this price, current price of the barrel, it's. Um, it's becoming uh, um, not economic feasible. So in the long run, uh, but I, I would say that Brazil is more or less his company. It's, uh, you know, it, uh, we certainly have to adapt our investment plans for the future, but it's not uh, uh, bad news uh, necessarily. It depends on, on how you, 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 you set your, your path. But what uh, um, what I'm um, a bit uh, worried. Uh, now I've been to all all the BRIC countries in the last 
especially 2008 onwards. And I was, in all these countries, I was stuck in a traffic jam. All of them, you know, really big traffic jams. And, you know, in, in Brazil, you know, people make, had income growth, as I said, had, you know, formal jobs. So do, do big conquests. Uh, Brazilians made. But between these two conquests, there is a nightmare, which is how I move from my home to my job back and forth. And uh, so I think we have to devise, you know, because low oil prices means not only for the environment, but, you know, time. You're going to consume our time, you know, stuck in a traffic jam. This is very bad, uh, not only for the uh, economy, but also for welfare. And, um, you know, I think uh, you're talking about, you know, the BRICS is, uh, is an idea, as, you know, that Brazil, Russia, it's an idea, you know, but if we talk about Brazilians, Russians, Chinese, Indians, about the population, I think this is the, the good news is that you can buy your car, um, you can drive your car, but there is a, a, a composition problem there. And the bad news is you can buy your car and you can drive your car. You can drive your car. It's, it's but the same good news as the bad news. That's right. <laughs> but we, we, we have, for example, we have an initiative in Brazil which is called BRT, Br Bus Railway Transit, which is almost BRT, Brazilian Transportation, which, you know, it's bus. On the, I know in India you have, you know, some of the... Brazilian uh, bus, big bu buses, and so we have to, to look after solutions before it comes, you know, the problem arise, and we have already a big traffic problem. The, the, this oil thing, you just mentioned the comparison with India, for India it's a blessing. Okay, it's certainly a plus. You see, as far as India is concerned, uh, we of course have our own exploration, but uh, we are still short, and therefore our current account deficits uh, are now more balanced. Uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, problem with our oil companies. I think uh, a lot of their problems are being solved. And most important, our inflation is broadly under control. The oil prices were con contributing to it. So with food prices and uh, oil prices, uh, we have a modest level of inflation. In the case of South Africa, uh, I've associated oil, not, not necessarily a direct link, but in terms of energy, in terms of what the country needs in energy, you're having a serious problem with electricity supplies in South Africa. Uh, will that become better or worse with this oil situation? How would that impact South Africa? And if you could describe to us also what this uh, electricity power failures represent. Look, the, um, the oil price indeed has, um, you know, come as a bit of a benefit to us. But uh, as you will uh, understand, the, the full benefit is not passed through onto the consumer because it came at a time when the currency also uh, was not performing well. But the currency did exactly wh why we have, I mean, it, it just confirmed uh, the correctness of our floating uh, currency regime. Because um, if the benefit can't go through to the consumer in, in full, it means also that uh, in times in, in, uh, of uh, a, a price rise in fuel, it also won't be passed on to the consumer. So it serves as uh, really as a shock absorber. And, uh, but we've uh, experienced a reduction in uh, the price of um, uh, fuel uh, to the tune of about uh, I mean, close to 40%. That has actually helped the consumer in that uh, the disposable income has increased. Um, but also that uh, buffer and the, and the shock absorber has also protected us from the inflation uh, uh, feed through. Um, in terms of our electricity challenges, it is indeed uh, a, a time for us also to take advantage of this time uh, to <coughs> accelerate our um, um, electricity uh, build uh, program. We are in the process of building new power plants. 
uh, which are due to be completed uh, quite soon. Uh, but at the same time, we have identified the need to diversify in our elect um, energy generation and bring in the private sector. Um, since more than 90% of our energy was actually um, generated by a, a state-owned uh, agency, our ESCOM. And now we've uh, opened up for uh, 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 independent power producers who have actually been able to deliver in excess of a thousand uh, megawatts into into the grid we also now are exploring uh, 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 possibilities of uh, cogeneration we are at an advanced stage in order to do that i would want to believe that this has presented us with an opportunity to work with the private sector to address our energy challenge and continue because we in our focus also to connect more households uh, we probably did not uh, support that with um, a, a, a plan also to uh, maintain our uh, aging uh, electricity plants. But uh, we are in a, in a situation now where that is receiving uh, attention and uh, we are likely to come out of it. It's a, it's a period that uh, has presented challenges to us, but uh, we, it, it, it's under control. Uh, I've been monopolizing. Uh our guests too much. That perhaps there might be a question from the audience that we could uh, we could uh, you know help to contribute to the to the gentleman here in front. Thank you. Uh, my name is Salil Shetty. I'm the Secretary General of Amnesty International. Uh, obviously, we had conversations mainly on economics, but it's very much linked to the broader questions of stability. Uh, now, I would say that most countries, the BRICS countries, have been very skeptical about uh, the way in which uh, Western uh, powers have selectively used human rights and democracy ideas over time. For example, going soft on Saudi Arabia, but very hostile when it comes to Iran, human rights abuse, or even internally, domestically, Guantanamo Bay, uh, you know, mass surveillance, etc. So now I think as BRICS are getting more powerful, at least for the democratically elected BRICS, uh, India, South Africa, Brazil, uh, can the world expect that these countries will start speaking up when you have mass human rights violations like Syria or Sri Lanka? Is that a fair expectation? You're addressing to someone specifically? At least uh, India, Brazil, South Africa. I can start with India. Yeah, no <laughs> uh, you want to start? In India? Will All you? Right. <laughs> Certainly have made uh, a very significant point. We'll keep it in mind. Uh, BRICS has been uh, discussing on various platforms. And I think uh, as the idea of BRICS takes shape, uh, the extent on which they are to take political positions with regard to other countries will certainly be an uh, agenda on the BRICS. Uh, indeed, as, uh, even though BRICS was started as an economic uh, 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 platform for the five countries, uh, it is uh, true and correct that uh, in a number of uh, instances and engagements, we actually have taken collaborative and we are a voice of the emerging markets. Um, and um, in the G20, in, um, in the IMF, the World Bank, we have worked together. And um, I would imagine uh, going forward again, as uh, my uh, colleague from India has indicated, that uh, I would imagine that uh, geopolitical um, issues would also um, uh, form part of our agenda. I believe for Brazil, human rights and democracy are key. I mean, to, if you want to analyze the country, the progress, I mean, we had two lost decades, the 80s and part of the 90s, but we became a democracy. We kept this. We know we made so, uh, social advancements. So human rights are essential. And I think that perhaps we have to move to a 2.0 agenda in the sense of not only avoid negative human rights like you know child died before five years of age but you know a child has uh, the right to learn to play etc and this is a, a very active uh, agenda in brazil and uh, you know uh, interaction with civil society and um, because i think the the greatest richness of our countries numbers is population-wise. We have 40% of the world population. 
And we are not talking about only numbers, but we are talking about you know, what these people can achieve, what are their rights. Uh, we, we're actually going to hold uh, a host, uh, a meeting on population and development in Brasilia with all the BRIC countries in about uh, just the week before Carnival. And this will be a central issue. Week there. before Carnival is very symbolic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't have too much time, but the gentleman right here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I noticed there are more than one finance minister on the panel. So, uh, Professor Lin mentioned China has more uh, some fiscal capacity that it can use. I'm just wondering first, um, how realistic can we expect China to expand it? Uh, certainly not over three percent on deficit rate, right? And second, how uh, what kind of role um, fiscal policy can play in the future development of BRICS countries as since in the recent past, I think monetary policy has been, has been the main show in countries like China and India and perhaps other BRICS countries. Well, as I mentioned, the Chinese government is a very you know, strong in its physical position. And uh, the government's role is to adapt counter cyclical intervention when you have external shock in the demand and so if there's those kind of situation, certainly Chinese government will be in a position to use its physical strength to support certain investment and consumption. And use that investment and consumption to leverage private sector's investment and consumption. And for that reason, I think that Chinese economy is very resilient, very stable and uh, will still continue to be a strong engine of growth in the world. And uh, there's some lesson that we can learn from the Chinese counter cyclic intervention. Because most of the counter cyclic intervention in China in the past were used to make investment in infrastructure, which was the bottleneck of growth of the economy. And uh, you know, that idea China did in 1998 Asian financial crisis, in 2008, global financial crisis. And I'd like to say, I'm very happy to see this kind of ways of counter cyclical intervention recently has been endorsed by the IMF. In the October last year, they have a chapter in the World Economic Outlook. And they advocate, whenever you have a slowdown in the economy, it's the best way to make investment in infrastructure. And it's a lesson to learn from China in the past decades. It's, it's been a very interesting discussion, but believe it or not, we've covered one hour already. So our time is exhausted. And there's another conference coming after hours, so I cannot stretch it any longer. I can only thank our panel here for being here and, and your attention here as well. And I think we've come up with, some, with a better understanding of the BRICS and let's see what happens next year. Good night.